Good evening and welcome to the special edition of the 100 ABC Fireside Chat, Women Redefining History. At this time, we would like to take a moment to bring to you the Indigenous and Afrocentric land acknowledgements. Sarah and I acknowledge that we are currently on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to the time immemorial. We honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory and uphold and uplift the voice and values of our host nation. Sarah will now bring to you the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement in French. Alors, bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Nicole et moi reconnaissons que nous sommes situés euh, sur le territoire non cédé de la nation algonquine Anishinaabe présente en ces lieux depuis des, des temps immémoriaux. Nous saluons leur longue tradition d'accueil dont ont bénéficié, ont bénéficié de nombreuses nations dans ce magnifique territoire et nous nous engageons à défendre et à promouvoir la voix et les valeurs de notre nation haute. Nicole? Thank you, Sarah. The Afrocentric Land Acknowledgement. As people of African descent, we offer this land acknowledgement in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions towards decolonization. As people of African descent, we acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us, express deep gratitude to its indigenous peoples and pledge to honor our dignity and divinity that ultimately connects us all. By Kay Johnson. Sarah. La reconnaissance africentrique du territoire. En tant que personne de descendance africaine, Nous offrons cette reconnaissance des terres en solidarité avec les peuples autochtones de la grande île de la Tortue dans le cadre des efforts et des intentions délibérées envers la décolonisation. En tant que personne d'origine africaine, nous reconnaissons la grande île de la Tortue qui nous soutient, exprimons une profonde gratitude au peuple des Premières Nations, des Métis et Inuits, et nous nous engageons à honorer la dignité et le divin qui, en fin de compte, nous unissent. Par Kay Johnson. Thank you. We now turn you back over to the 100 ABC video montage and welcome to Women Redefining History. And welcome everyone who's listening in to the ABC 100 Women's Fireside Chat from among the accomplished Black Canadian women honorees. Uh, 100 accomplished Black Canadian women fireside chatting. 100 ABC younger women that are showcasing com- 100 Black women. Uh, du programme 100 accomplished Black Canadian women. Thank you, everyone. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. It was you my pleasure. Me. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It's been a pleasure, ladies. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so again. much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. That is just a little snippet of what has been happening over this while. And now we would like to bring to you our special song that was curated just for us by Liberty Silver. And uh, I, I, I'm going to try my best not to cry because I tear up Sarah every time I hear this. Um, you may want to say this in French, but I, I am just so excited by the 100 ABC song by Liberty Silver. Oui, alors nous allons maintenant entendre la chanson qui a été uh, spécialement uh, écrite et chantée pour 100 ABC Women par la grande chanteuse canadienne Liberty Silver. Look how far you have come on your own, but never alone. Through the rain and through the shine, here's your moment, it's your time. And now you see Standing in your destiny 100 women Growing strong 100 women Where you belong You stood tall 
tall and now you see you have reached your destiny woman Oh my gosh. Well, now we invite the architect, Donna Joan Simmons, to the forefront. Liberty Silver, we love you, we honor you. And we, we forgot to mention, Nicole, that the wonderful gentleman accompanying yes. Liberty Silver is the award winning composer and pianist, Eddie Bullen. Yes, he's so amazing, so talented. And so we thank them for doing that for us. And the architect, Donna Joan Simmons, we throw it over to you. We yield the mic. Show her some love in the chat. Give her your hearts and your, your warm round of applause. Donna? Welcome and good evening to host, panelists, 100 ABC tech support team, social media and communications team, Crystal Van Westrop, Luke Sinius, and Thomas Herbert from the TD team, and of course, of family, friends, and guests. My name is Donna Joan Simmons, and I'm the co-author, co-founder, and the architect of the 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women Project. On behalf of co-authors and co-founders, Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green, and I, please accept our deepest appreciation for your continued engagement and interest in the work of 100 ABC Women and for being here today. In recognition of Women's History Month, we are pleased to present a special fireside chat titled Women Redefining History. Of course, you do know that we have delivered several book launches and galas, symposiums, and just recently, 33 fireside chats on topics that are important and beneficial to our communities and were supported by BIPOC Executive Search Inc. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate our panelists who are redefining history for their participation in this conversation. Let me be clear though, there are many other accomplished Black and Asian women who are in our database, who have achieved so much and significantly gave back to our communities. For example, our very own Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, the first Black female MP, Dr. Anna Jarvis, who has mentored and supported just about every single Black medical student <laughs> who attended medical school at the University of Toronto, and there are many, many more. We feel compelled to spotlight 400 honorees whenever and wherever we can. Their stories are unique and awe-inspiring. I would encourage you to read their stories in our publications about these women. I am hopeful that our brilliant and Black Canadian women will continue to achieve greater heights and we will share their work through our project. We are confident that you, your children, and future generations too will be inspired to soar to greater heights. Today, we want to thank TD Ready commitment for their work and support. Thank you. I've often said that at TD, we have a higher calling. Today, we're taking the next step in bringing the promise of tomorrow to millions of our neighbors across North America. The ready commitment is not just title for an initiative. It is a call to action. The world is changing quickly. We're experiencing shifts in how people live and work driven by new technologies and new economic realities. At TD, we're committed to building an inclusive future. The Ready Commitment is focused on four areas that together support change, progress, and contribute to making the world a better and more inclusive place. Creating opportunities for people to improve their financial security. Contributing to a more vibrant planet. Connecting communities in big and small ways and investing in innovation to help create more equitable health outcomes. As part of our commitment, TD is targeting $1 billion by 2030 towards community giving in these four areas because we believe everyone should have the opportunity to thrive and succeed in a changing world. We're ready for an inclusive future. Without further ado, 
Let me introduce you to today's phenomenal co-hosts, Nicole Waldron and Sarah Oniango. Nicole Waldron is a professional event planner, inspirational speaker, author, community advocate, and host of the Victory Speaks podcast and the Victory Speaks online show. She works for the advancement and prosperity of her community, raising awareness on co-op housing, mental health, and other issues. She sits on the board of the cooperators, the Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada, CHF Canada, and the Ontario Caregiver Organization. Nicole serves on committees with the Canadian Mental Health Hospital, CAMH, Stella's Place, and the Family Caregivers Advisory Network of CAN. Nicole is a 2018 100 accomplished Black Canadian woman and one of 150 women in Canada by How She Hustles, her story in Black series. She is a recipient of the 2020 Brian Burke Community Service Award from CHFT, the Outstanding Community Service Award from Dance Carib. Nicole was also presented with the Social Housing Service Corporation Kathleen Blinkhorn Award for Excellence in Volunteerism. Now for Sarah, Sarah Onyango. She was born in Kenya and is a translator by trade and is a well-known figure within Ottawa's community television and radio scene. She hosts a monthly African culture program Fontan From on Rogers TV Cable 22. Ottawa, as well as the weekly radio programs Black on Black and Africa Revisited on CHUO 89.1 FM, University of, of Ottawa Community Radio. She has also written articles for The Spectrum, Ottawa's English language, Black monthly community newspaper, a tireless promoter of African and Caribbean culture and activities. Saria has for many years been actively involved in public relations work for various African and Caribbean diplomatic missions, as well as numerous community organizations such as Black History Ottawa, Fete Carib, Dream Makers, the Jamaican Ottawa Community Association, and the United Way. Sarah has acted as master of ceremonies for various high profile events, including the 10th anniversary of South Africa's post apartheid democracy 2004, 25th anniversary of the organization of Eastern Caribbean states 2006, and the African Union Day Gala 2006 to 2012, as well as galas and forums by community organizations such as OCISO. Over to you, Nicole and Sarah. Wow, that's us, Sarah. I don't even believe that. I don't recognize I'm myself. Totally surreal. And um, it's so such an honor to be introduced by Donna Joan Simmons. Thank you so much, Donna. It is such an honor to be doing this special uh, chat this evening, Women Redefining History. And we commend you as you're one of these amazing women redefining history. And you are that architect that just keeps building and building and building, building infrastructure so that we can continue to move the pendulum. Thank you. So welcome everyone to this specially curated fireside chat, Women Redefining History. And tonight as we wind down Women, Women's History Month, we will hear from four outstanding women that have been making their mark nationally and internationally. This year, the international theme we understand is break the bias. And for me, Sarah, one of the things I love is as much as I love the international theme, I love what they have done in Canada. The theme is women inspiring women. This theme of women inspiring women is very apropos this year. Uh, especially as we we just finished our first um, our first season of the fireside chats, which are all about women inspiring women, 
And uh, we really are looking forward to another very, very inspiring conversation with the panelists we have. So why don't you go ahead and introduce our, uh, the representative for our sponsor. It brings me, thank you, Sarah, it brings me great pleasure tonight because tonight it is specially curated um, with the help of TD Bank. They are our official sponsor of this special fireside chat. And to bring us greetings is Crystal Van Westrop. She is a national manager for women in enterprise at TD Bank. She's um, been there for over 14 years. And in her current role, Crystal leads the business bank strategy around women owned and women led businesses by collaborating internally and externally on partnerships to support women in enterprise, we, the WE, and by educating stakeholders and colleagues on the, on the WE segment and solutions to facilitate the success and growth of women in enterprise and at TD. Please give a warm virtual welcome. And I know you can do it. She may not hear your round of applause, but I know she can see your comments in the chat and your hearts and your, and your, your claps. Crystal, welcome to the virtual stage of women redefining history. And we commend you for being one of these women. Thank you so, so much, uh, both to you, Nicole and Sarah. Um, what a uh, amazing introduction. I feel uh, not worthy of it, but very grateful for it. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking everyone here today and saying good evening, everyone. Um, as, they, as they said, my name is Crystal Van Westrop. I'm the National Manager of Women in Enterprise for Business Banking at TD. And on behalf of TD, I would like to welcome you or, to tonight's fireside chat. Um, first, very big thank you to Donna. Uh, you've been a tremendous support since I first met you. And uh, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity to have connected with you and, and learn from your experiences as well. And also thank you to all of 100 ABC Women for inviting TD to the event today. And I can tell you I'm personally honored to be here and providing these remarks. Um, thank you also for the work that you do each and every week uh, to host these inspiring, thought-provoking conversations that highlight the success of not only women, but Black women, and open the doors to providing inspirational role models to women across the country, as well as providing relevant and much-needed conversations. I would encourage everyone to visit the YouTube page to watch all of these fireside chats that are available, as well as reading and purchasing the books written as well. Your mandate and TD's values align as we are committed to helping support women's success at every stage. While as, a, while as a society, there has been great progress for advancing equality of women, it is important to keep pushing forward to advance women's rights so that we truly do have an equal voice. TD's partnership with 100 accomplished Black Canadian women stands tall among the broader commitment that TD plans to invest 1 billion by 2030 in support of inclusive organizations, such as yourselves that empower women, but also black women to become not only entrepreneurs, but also spotlight those that have had achieved great work. Much like our highly talented and successful hosts and panelists you will hear from tonight. We all win when we invest in women's success in reflection of tonight's event, I thought to myself about something that came up in the conversation earlier this week with these amazing women. It was a question posed to each of them referencing the title of this chat tonight, um, Women Redefining History. I won't reveal the details that were shared, but only to say each of these women are in their own right awe-inspiring. In fact, I reached out to Donna in private email right afterwards to ask, Am I really the right person to be doing the opening remarks tonight? She answered almost immediately that yes, of course I was, and that's why I was invited. So now here I was sitting in front of my computer screen thinking, what on earth have I done that is half as inspirational as these women today? Or how is that I'm bringing, I'm going to be able to provide the same type of story as they can about breaking down barriers. You may have read some of their bios prior to joining but each of them has had a journey that has taken twists and turns and led them to being leaders in their fields and commanding so much respect from mining to engineering to the sports world and so much more. What have I done? I'm a wife, I'm a mom of two young children that's exhausted most of the time 
and I'm a boring banker. So what did I do? I reached out to my mom, my number one fan and the person that I call when I need anything. You know what she said? She asked me, what am I most proud of over the time that I've been at the bank? I said, mom, this is not the time. I'm not feeling positive right now, but she pushed me. I started telling her about the many young women that I have mentored over the years and watching the success and barriers they have broken down for themselves. I told her about volunteering on the two largest internal volunteer committees in the bank, which influenced personal growth and career growth, as well as community involvement. And I told her about becoming the first female director in our national accounts group in Toronto and the pride that I took with the job in negotiating some of the largest fees with clients versus my male peers. I told her about volunteering on women's committee in the community and how much I enjoyed that. And I told her about taking on this role as the national manager for women in enterprise, supporting women owned and women led businesses for the business bank at TD. In this role that bridges my passion project for supporting women and doing it for a living. It was a huge opportunity for me. I have this unique chance to meet so many women across the country from all backgrounds, areas of business. And you know what I've learned? Women inspire women. Women are role models for women and we are strong. We are redefining history and we are breaking down so many barriers. 100 ABC women have taken this year's series of fire side chats to new heights with tangible outcomes, including a financial literacy team, which was formed and we know that this is a top priority for women to access this type of information. A DEI team formed by Janelle Skerritt and Nicole Waldron, a tech team being formed by Jerry Watkins in BC, and Teresa Nabrezi, who, who is present today and is forming an engineering team. It is with my great pleasure to thank 100 ABC Women for all of the work that you have done this year and today. And it has been no small feat, but you have accomplished so much. Thank you. Wow, you're on mute, Sarah, you're on mute. I was so wrapped up in what she was saying. Thank you so much, Crystal. Merci beaucoup, Crystal, pour tout le travail que vous faites à la Banque TD pour justement soutenir les femmes en entreprise, les entreprises dirigées par des femmes. We really need more of that kind of empowering of our uh, women in business and in community. Thank you so much for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the moment we have all been waiting for. We are going to hear from our illustrious panel who have redefined history and are continuing to do so. So tonight's panelists are Teresa Nyabeze from the mining sector, we have Camille Mitchell from the architectural sector. We have another Camille, Camille Dundas from the media sector. And we have Bernice Carnegie from the hockey sector. So after the conversation, we're going to move to a Q and A session. And that will be followed by uh, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green. And for the Q&A session, you can already start thinking of the questions that you want to pose. So Camille Dundas, 2022, 100 ABC Women Honoree. Camille Dundas is the editor-in-chief of Canada's largest Black online magazine, byblacks.com. And she's also a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant who has been giving back as a mentor for Black women and girls through various programs run by community organizations like Women's Health and Women's Hands, and also by hiring multiple journalism student interns every year at buyblacks.com. Teresa Nyabeze is a professional mining engineer and an avid community organizer. And in addition to her contributions to technical excellence and diversity in mining. She's a recipient of a top 40 under 40 award in recognition of her role as a community change maker in the greater city of Sudbury. And she is a 2018 honoree. And over to you, Nicole, to introduce our two other panelists. 
Well, it's an honor. Camille Mitchell is an architect with Toronto firm KPMB. She has worked on projects such as the new commercial tower development for the Bay Adelaide Centre and the renovation design for the Park Hyatt Hotel and Residences. She's an advocate of quality in her field through the organizational BEAT, which offers mentoring and networking to women in architecture. And Bernice Carnegie is a speaker who specializes in Black anti-racism and the promotion of mental health. Bernice is making history by being a part of the first BIPOC ownership of a professional women's hockey team, the Toronto Six. And she's a 2018 honoree. Now you know that the, the bios that we just gave you was just a snippet of the plethora of things that these women bring to the table. And so we are going to start by asking them uh, uh, some, some questions. So Sarah, over to you. Yes, so this first uh, round of questions is going to be biographical. And it's an opportunity to really sort of flesh out, you know, the, the mini bios. So could each of you briefly take us through your professional journey and tell us what makes you unique in your field? You start with Camille Dundas. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, wow, that's a big, <laughs> big question. <laughs> so it's so hard to keep it brief because I um, there are so many uh, parts that have brought me to this journey now. Um, I was on a, a panel earlier today and it was about um, starting businesses and they asked, um, you know, what what were the pros and cons of starting your, your business? And I said, well, first I have to tell you that I didn't get into my business, get into entrepreneurship um, willingly, um, it was out of necessity. And uh, that's how I became a business owner. I never thought of myself um, as an entrepreneur or a business owner. Um, I didn't have um, any entrepreneurs in my family. I grew up in St. Lucia uh, and my parents were all about good university, you know, become a lawyer like your sister or become something, you know, some type of professional. So I got away with journalism. They were okay with that. Um, and I would say uh, what makes us different at Buy Blacks um, when compared to our peers, I suppose, uh, is consistency and commitment. I think that one of the reasons that we've been able to stick around for going on eight, nine years now is because we're relentless, because we are committed to um, uplifting and shining a light on positive Black stories. Um, whereas, you know, I've seen a lot of um, platforms pop up and then leave and then, you know, you they kind of just come and go. And, and that's that's awesome. I want people to try things. But it, I, 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 I if, when asked that question, I would I would say that we, our our commitment and this is it, it's it's a lesson because starting any type of business or any type of platform requires real digging your heels in and not quitting even when you want to. And I have to give all props to my husband, Roger Dundas, because he is, between the two of us, the only one who's never wanted to quit. Whereas <laughs> I will readily admit to you, I wanted to shut this down several times out of sheer frustration. And Camille, <laughs> yes. one thing, one thing uh, you didn't mention is that you left CTV, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you left the corporate world. You yeah. had a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. high visibility you were a producer yeah uh and then you left yeah. all of that behind to start this well interestingly we roger and i had started by blacks while i was still working at ctv and i remember one day showing uh in fact it was marcy ian who i used to work with another incredible black woman um and i remember showing it to her we worked in the same newsroom i was like hey we just started this. she's like well that's amazing and she was looking at it on my screen and one of my coworkers, who's white was sitting behind me and he peeked over my shoulder he's like buyblacks.com he's like well imagine if i started a website called buywhites.com <laughs> and i was like you know i'm just gonna let that I'm just gonna let that slide today <laughs> because it's not every day that i can take y'all on um, so those are the kinds of you know challenges that we've been through both you know um to be honest with you both from between um sorry from outside of the community and within the community um, we're gonna get back to that we're, yeah we're, we'll <laughs> get to the other speakers and sure. yeah that's a very important point you bring up uh Absolutely. teresa 
Yeah, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you to uh, 100, 100 Accomplished Black Women for the invitation. And also special thanks to the sponsor, uh, TD, for making this happen. Um, yeah, so I'm very much attached to be around all of you distinguished uh, women to tonight, uh, especially, you know, if I look at, at the fact that we're in International Women's, uh, when, uh, Women's History Month, um, and so let me give you a, a brief background of myself, my professional journey, and kind of what makes me unique in my field. Um, so what happened with me is um, I started working in the mining industry 20 years ago. I'm a mining engineer, and I'm basically located in the mining capital of the world, I like to call it, uh, Sudbury, Ontario. And I quickly living in our community came to really appreciate the positive impact mining can have on a community in terms of the social impact um when you know my young son played uh, hockey and he was a goalie but some of his favorite coaches were actually people who are frontline supervisors in the mining industry and so for me i I've always kind of connected mining to my own personal why, which is my, mining done right can really uplift and build communities. And uh, so for me, I would say something that's unique about me and my interaction in the mining industry is while I'm very technically astute and can tell you all types of wonderful things about, you know, the, the reserves and resources and how, you know, the business side of mining, one of the other things that I'm very, very uh, driven about is actually ESG, which is really us looking at the sustainability piece around mining. So if somebody was to say what's really unique about me in the mining industry, I think I would say my uniqueness comes from being very technically astute, but also having this real deep compassion for how we build up the communities in which we live and tying that all together. So I would say um, I consider myself a, a glue of so sorts. Let's take the technical and the social mix it together for the optimal success of mining. That That's amazing. That really truly is unique, especially in this era of, you know, uh, the quest for environmental responsibility, especially in the extractive industries like mining. We're going to go into the architecture world now with Camille Mitchell. Tell us a little bit more about your professional journey. Uh, premièrement, je veux vous remercier de m'avoir invité oh, ici. merci en français. <laughs> oui, je veux, 13 years of French immersion, I need to drop that in. Um, <laughs> but uh, architecture, I would like to, I would start, if you Google great architects, uh, the top 50 are, 49 are men. Um, one's a woman. Um, nine are pe pe people of color, zero are black. So that's the world I work in right now. So I found out um, when I was starting grad school that, licensed architects in the United States equal 0.2% of licensed architects that are black women are 0.2%. So I grew up in Hamilton, went to French immersion, went to Waterloo for university. I was accustomed to being the minority, but did not know I entered a profession where I didn't exist. So um, I was fortunate in 2017 to be featured as part of Emily Mills as her story in black product project and also within the Globe and Mail talking about diversity. And since then I was contacted by numerous black architects and interior designers. And so since then we have formed an organization called Beta, Black Architects and Interior Designers. So it's a Canadian association where we promote um, excellence and, the and architects in the design community. But I'm, I'm here today. It's also great to, like, to increase the diversity in the architecture pro profession, but also increase the importance of design to the Black community as well. So because how the building shapes, the size of your windows, what you look at affects you on a day-to-day. -day. So it's not necessarily your own home, but it's your business. Even the businesses in your community, how your community is dressed. And it's not left just to architecture in the built environment, but landscaping, furniture, textiles, and what is chosen for certain groups and certain individuals. So people to be more aware and more speak towards. So, and yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah that's, yeah, that's amazing. And we're gonna, uh, in, in a subsequent question, we're gonna talk about that experience of being the only or the first um, thing. And last but not least, Bernice Carnegie, who I actually met through her very famous dad, Bernice. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here and thank you to all who made this possible and to allow us to share some of our stories. 
Well, I'm the, uh, I'm the participant that's closer to 80 than I am to 70. So I have a lot to say, but I'm going to say just a teeny weeny little bit. Um, did I think that I would be a part owner of a hockey team? Hmm, farthest thing from my mind. I didn't think I was going to be anything, really, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I was, a, I was a nightmare at school for most teachers who had to kind of push and push and push and help me along. Um, I thought I would follow my mother's footsteps and I would be a homemaker and, and a wife, to, you know, and, and have kids and I'd have the house with the white picket fence and life would be wonderful. And uh, for a while, it was. <laughs> and then uh, after 10 years, I discovered that I became a single mom with three kids and I had to reinvent myself. And uh, so I've been a lot of things. So let's go through all of that. I was an executive assistant, an executive director. I've been on a lot of boards. I'm a speaker, I'm an author. I'm a co-founder of two charities of the Herbert H. Carnegie Future Aces Foundation and the Carnegie Initiative just recently, and now the part owner. And I really had to redefine my life uh, after marriage and figure out what am I going to do with myself and how am I going to feed my kids? <laughs> so who would have thought that all of these things would have happened to me? Uh, my father nudged me into being a financial advisor and an insurance agent. And I managed to um, raise a great family. But what about this being an owner? Well, I come by it honestly. There are 11, I counted, 11 family members who have actually taken hockey seriously. Starting with my father, who was a ground baker, groundbreaker, trailblazer, uh, one of the first hockey players uh, to make his scene in the all white community of hockey, along with his brother Ozzy and Manny McIntyre. And uh, they had colorful names for them, you know, the Brown Bombers, the Dark Destroyers, the Ink Spots, the Dusty Raiders. And uh, they certainly made hockey history as the first all black line. So my father, when he finished hockey, ended up having a hockey school. So hockey, 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 here it comes. Uh, he had the first hockey school in Canada called Future Aces. Young men trying to be the best of who they can be. Well. His initiative of Future Aces went into schools. I ended up running a foundation. My father was blind when we were on the verge of being blind when we started the foundation. And uh, I had to do the deed and be his legs, his arms. He had a voice, but I, I kind of chimed in with mine and actually built that organization so that we affected over 100,000 students a year with character development, trying to empowerment and all of those things that keep you uh, moving forward. And so does that qualify me to be? <laughs> yes, it does indeed. The part owner of yes. Toronto Six? Yes. Well, all of that experience uh, working in the community and being part of, uh, you know, speaking for 40 years, um, being on all of the boards. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think I have a lot to contribute. Yes, and I concur. And thank you for looking after your legendary father so, so well. I'll turn it over to Nicole with the next question. Well, to our esteemed audience, are you inspired already? Just listening to these women, they have, they think they've passed breaking the glass ceiling. They are at a whole nother level. And um, so it makes us very curious because you have become true, what we call change agents and agents of change. So what made you decide Camille that you wanted to be in the field that you're in? What was that aha moment? You know, let me get a little Oprah on you. What was that aha moment, girl? Tell us. Is it this Camille or Camille Mitchell? Just checking. It would be Camille Dundas, sorry. Okay. Sorry, Dundas and then Mitchell. Okay. I don't think there's anything else I ever wanted to be. 
when I was eight, nine or so, my dad and I, we had this ritual that wasn't really spoken of. We didn't really know it was a ritual, but looking back, it's something we did every weekend. He would get all the newspapers and he would sit and read them one after the other. And I would kind of sit at his feet and wait till he was finished reading them. He would pass it on to me and then I would read through the other one and then so on and so on. And by the end of the hour or so, both of our fingers were like covered in ink. And I remember just loving that and go just, just like absorbing the words and words were just always my, my place. Like it's where I wanted to go. And I remember specifically seeing one quote on one of those newspapers on the, on the front page every, every week it said, um, the pen is mightier than the sword. And that was like their motto for that newspaper. And in my 10 year old brain, I was like, oh, that means that writing stuff can have power you can you can make change you can do something in this world with your words so that great gave me a great sense of i can do something different than everyone no one else in my family kind of everyone had their thing right and as a middle child i was looking for my thing you know and i was like okay this is it and i honestly it, it and you know when you're when you're wanting to do something sometimes the your life the, your stars just align around that it just so happened that we moved to a house that was down the street from the local television news station and so I literally grew up like next door to the TV station. And one summer when we were, I was 17, my friend and I we would watch this show. Uh, this is growing up in St. Lucia. And it was the show called Video Vibes, right? So it was like a, think of like your BET like show, like video show, right? But it was hosted by this guy who was like not in our age group. And we're like, oh, this sucks. Like we could do a much better job. So we write this letter and mail it to them, telling them that we should be the host of the show. They respond. And they're like, yeah, sure, come do it, but we're not paying you. We're like, okay, we'll do it. So we go there and we host the show for a summer and it was the best time of my life. And the the gentleman who was the news director at the time started mentoring me and, and like week after week, I would just go into the newsroom and sit there and watch him produce the news. And every time he did the countdown and the lights went out, went down and I was in the, I was like, this is, this, this is where I want to be. Like, it was so exciting to me. Like, and it sounds so nerdy, but it, it's all I ever wanted to do was, was to be a journalist. You know, it's, it's so interesting to hear the story of the synergy of you says, you know, you just never know. You literally were aligned from that age and look at you now. You're such a, you're, you, your way with words, you always pull me in with your words and you always pull me in the way that you're able to just share your thoughts and you take us deeper and deeper. So I am so glad that you said yes to, to your field. And you said yes when Roger said, no, I, 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 nope, nope. And he said, nope. And, uh, be, you know, the iron sharpeners and, and Roger, your partner, your husband, your beloved, and I think your children are following in your footsteps. And so, let me go to the architect, Camille Mitchell. And Camille, what was that aha moment? Because you've gone into a, a really, you, you're really breaking some barriers here in the field of architecture. What was that aha moment for you? I would say um, I was probably exposed to architecture before I even knew what an architect was. My dad immigrated to Canada from Trinidad as a draftsman, so I always <laughs> um, so I always had um, a drafting board in the house. And at the time, he had funny pencils, funny crayons, funny this. And I would say, as a child, my mother um, instead of camps, we would go to open houses on uh, every like on weekends, so that would always check out what was happening. So it's always this pride um, for the built environment and shaping it. But uh, like growing up, um, I always had a strong, um, a strong strength in visual arts and math. So architects, sure, just formed, because I also liked wood shop. I'm not sure if those classes still exist, but I always like building things. So architecture um, fell in as a natural path for that. And then also by the 11th grade, I'm from Hamilton. So I had placements in Hamilton. They directed me towards Waterloo. And with Waterloo, if you're familiar with the co-op program, you got experience right away. So you got to, so I, ha I had opportunities to work in New York and and Paris even, and use my French, um, and to go spend a term in Italy. Um, so uh, so yeah, so it was well-rounded. And then coming coming back to Canada and working in Toronto. And, and I think too, what's fortunate about my experience, I get to work on big buildings, big projects, because oftentimes 
people feel, especially as a Black woman, I'm, and there's nothing wrong with residential construction, but I get to literally shape Toronto skyline and point to that and point to large buildings to say, I'm helping with that and helping work on that. So I think that's fun. Camille, that's more than fun. Like you, you could actually go in a plane and say, I did that. And then another young person can go and said, I know there's a woman and she's also a black woman who mm -hmm. made that. It's, it's just mind boggling. And when I learned about you, I was just blown away. And so uh, the dear, I don't know, Bernice was trying to age herself in the room. She's looking like she's 50 and trying to tell us she's something, something other than that. Bernice, could you, I know it's hard because you, you have such a plethora of um, things that you have done, but we need you to find one of those aha moments because I think you have uh, different areas of that aha moment. Just, just pinpoint for us one of those aha moments for, for this in particular, let's, let's narrow it down for you. When you said, okay, I am now going to really go into owning or co-owning a hockey team. What was that bing bing thing? You know, I can't isolate um, hockey from my life because um, it is so intertwined. And so it was really interesting for me and also very rewarding for me to be sought out uh, to say uh, for, for other team owners to think that I had something that would be valuable enough to contribute to this amazing group of young women. And uh, I, <laughs> my daughter actually helped me come around to, to understanding uh, the importance of, of all of this. Uh, you know, she said, you know, you're a, you're a hockey daughter, you're a hockey mom, you're a hockey aunt, you're a hockey grandmother. <laughs> um, and so hockey is really a part of my life, but so is community. So the aha moment came in my 30s, actually, when my father started taking me to schools with him while he talked about, yes, his hockey, but he talked about values and how hockey was so important in teaching us to be leaders and good citizens. And that's what the sport actually does. And so now, I have this amazing opportunity to work with a group of women who have a vision of not just playing hockey because they're very talented, definitely very talented in the sport, but it's beyond the sport. It's about how they are envisioning themselves to be leaders and helping other young women to see themselves in areas that they never thought were possible. And so this is why this is so important um, because we now have a group of leaders that we're trying to take to another level where they can have um, uh, even make a career out of this, not just a hobby yes. to play hockey, but a career. And young women will have a place to go or they'll have a place to look to say, well, if those women can do this, yes, then we can do anything absolutely and you know bernice i'm challenging to any everybody listening here bernice you got to do a special and tell us when the next couple games are we need to find one day where we just bring a whole bunch of women and young girls to a game i'm just tearing up thinking about it okay i before That's i get ahead agenda. of myself before <laughs> i get ahead of myself i need to go into the mind i need to go into the mind because you know, when I think of mining, I never thought there would be a, a woman in mining. So mm -hmm. when, when I first heard about you, Teresa, I was just blown away. What was that moment for you that, I mean, you're so passionate. You do so many things. You're an author and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. aha moment for you that says, I want to become a mining engineer. Like, really? Yeah. And you know what? I wish there was an aha moment. And I wish I, I, could, I could say uh, that there was a defining moment. But what I will say is, 
the lack of the defining moment is actually what has driven the rest of my life. So what I mean by that is when I was in high school, I went to an all girls school, was really good at medicine and sciences. And one of my teachers said, Teresa, I, I see you becoming a doctor. And without much thought, I thought, okay, you know, I'm good at biology and all these other things. So let, let me go into a, a biological science. Sitting in my first year biology class, it was very clear biology is not my it's not my jam I respect it but I'm not interested in the biology biology at all and right away I needed something that had nothing to do with biology and was extremely math and you know science orientated and the university which I was at as a young young immigrant um, offered mining engineering as a as a choice and without any sort of mentorship of understanding other options throughout Canada or the idea of going to another university, I jumped onto the program. But what is interesting is while I was in it, I did face a lot of imposter syndrome in my, in, in my whole, in my being, because I knew I wasn't authentic. I knew I'd come to this career path by total accident. So for a long time, that influenced me within that program. It was only through uh, a young, an organization uh, called Women in Science and Engineering when they came to visit at the behest of one of my professors that I finally started to see role models. I saw women with children and women who were, you know, community organizers. And I could finally see elements of my future self in them that made me stay in mining. So I would definitely say for me, uh, the mining itself hadn't been a big aha moment. However, sticking with it was just, it was really based on seeing role models. But what I, why I stay today is really intertwined again with my core values that mining has been able to show me that you know, A, we're a big staple of everything we use today. I mean, you take your cell phone, mining has touched it. You take your cars. I, I really see the social governance part of um, the social interact, the interaction with society that is so tremendous, keeps me in mining. So that's been my kind of my tie-in moment uh, with mining. And I, I stick to lots. I, I do try and push people coming into the industry because I know there's opportunities. I know there's you know, good uh, compensation to be had and we are community builders. So why wouldn't you wanna be in mining and help build your communities? And my beautiful, my beautiful co-host Sarah, just loves yeah. to be passionate on I'm me. Mute myself. <laughs> yeah, no, I was completely <laughs> taken by what she was saying. And yes, it's true. Women in non-traditionally feminized fields, you know, and it's not just mining construction you know as four women four persons ele electricians welders etc cetera, etc cetera. we need more teresas out there you know promoting those careers but i digress we have to move on to our next question this 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 is a huge question right here gaining respect in your professional space you know how do you go about that i'm actually going to ask several questions in one question so that you you know you can sort of answer in an uninterrupted fashion. So how do you gain respect in your professional spaces? What makes you effective as a change driver in those spaces? And also, how do you achieve the balance between the need to prove yourself? So you know that imposter syndrome that Teresa was talking about, you know, the need to prove yourself and protecting your well-being because it's exhausting you can't be doing that all the time and lastly how do you make sure you're not distracted uh, by the never ending fight against prejudice in your particular field can we start with camille mitchell I saw your question coming, so I changed my background so I could speak to um, this project. So this is Northwestern University, uh, New Kellogg School of Business. New, um, so I worked on this project from design con conception all the way through construction. So this is in Illinois, outside of Chicago. And being on site there, so that's when I, um, so to speak to um, sort of proving yourself, because if you can imagine going on a construction site I was stopped initially. So whether it was from age, from gender, um, my race, it's just like, who are you? Because again, I'm not the architect in most people's eyes. So once you get across that, I think one of the most important things I relied on is my team. 
And when, when I say my team, oftentimes, and it was, the other five people going to Canada to review this project were white men. So when you're on site speaking to where the light should go or telling, giving direction to a team of, again, white men, <laughs> I need to speak for myself. I can't have my answer mansplained or what she meant was. So I first rely on my team to support me and let me answer and let me give direction. And all, it takes time and to build that confidence. And even if you don't know, just to even say, I don't know. And um, you had a series of questions. What was your second one? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, and you know how are you an effective change maker like changing that dynamic in your particular space yeah so again in architecture black women are still a minority um so when you are in um a position i think to architects where various hats at various times because sometimes you're client facing your, con your consultant facing your um, con contractor facing. So you have to sort of match whatever vibe that you're in at the time. But each time it's important to, um, there's at times when you are required to fake it till you make it. So if you don't know the answer, you have to have that confidence to push through your ideas. And, um, and if there's prejudice in the profession, of course there is, it's, um, it depends, I guess, where you are. It's it's not it's it's not you can't answer that with a blank state, because it may because prejudice is may not necessarily be overt or what you see on a TV show, people like whistling or something like that. It just may be an assumption, um, or or like even explaining a design. Um, to, I think sometimes you have to over explain yourself to be so that you can emphasize or with what your design vision is, but. Um, unfortunately, it's like, try, try again. And you have to like stay committed to the task. But I think overall, especially within the design profession, you rely on a team to get to the end goal and also to consult with and to confide with. Mm -hmm. And so what about your, your well-being? Like, how do you protect that? Well, um, work is work, right? So <laughs> I think my well-being... Um, well-being, because uh, architecture too is a stressful pr profession. So that's nothing to do with race. It is because you are managing um, a lot. Um, so it takes time to find that balance and also acknowledging when too much is too much and when you have too much on your plate. And um, it's it's my family can attest to this and they're watching on YouTube. Hey. Um, <laughs> my family can attest to this because I can be it's hard to explain what you're doing to someone, like what you're drawing or what your vision is because you're just trying to get it out on paper. But um, there's, I think you have to personally draw the line when it's time to stop. It's, it was hard with COVID working at home because you had literally no bell to ring to go home. So you had to, I had to put lunch in my calendar, walk in my calendar. So just to reserve that time for me right because because I don't have any kids so either co-workers who had kids were easily excused to go to school or pick up a dog I have neither so it's like I have to set a time aside for me to be me and to find that balance wow. which I still do COVID or no COVID I still have my lunch and my walk yeah. blocked out yeah so the importance of the team that surrounds you and and having your personal boundaries and establishing boundaries with other people the other camille camille dundas in the media field um, gaining, gaining gaining respect, respect. with yeah. yes yes <laughs> so the field of media is a very disrespectful place overall um, because of the speed of which things move, um, we speak to each other very shortly, very curtly. Um, my husband used to have a joke. He would say, don't speak to me in your CTV voice. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, don't, don't bring that shit at home. Don't do it. Don't. <laughs> because it was hard for me <laughs> to like, not, you know, like not speak to everyone like that. I'm so glad to check myself. So getting respect as a woman in any field, for me, the key is understanding the difference between being kind and being nice. Being nice 
comes actually comes from a place of insecurity where we are constantly trying to please and we want people to like us because that's what we've been taught. Whereas being kind come from a place of power. I know what I have and I'm kind enough to bless you with it, to grace you with my talents. So that gains me respect because I'm not constantly trying to please people. And I set boundaries with people from the outset of our relationship. So when you come into a new workplace, it's important to set boundaries. Whereas many of, of the women I've spoken to over time, they'll say, well, you know, when you first start a new job, you know, you gotta, you gotta play it nice. You gotta do this. You know, you gotta, you, like, it's like the whole the thing that black women do. We, we wear our, 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 um, our wig to the, <laughs> to the interview and to the first, and then a couple months later, then they'll see it. It's like, no, no, don't. They have to see the real me from the outside because they have to know when you cross this line, it's going to be a problem. So I'll give you an example. Many, okay, I'll give you a personal example. And this happens to many women where, Camille, I'm sure you can attest to this as well, where people try to, to dump their work on you, right? Mm -hmm. Where they'll try, they'll just see you as the workhorse and they'll try to overload you with stuff. One time a, a, um, a male colleague of mine texted me at about 8.30 at night and said, hey, do you have, can you just jump on a quick call to talk about this? So I texted back saying, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I can. It must be urgent. So, yeah, let's jump on a call. And he texted back saying, no, no, I just wanted to go over the presentation before tomorrow. I said, that doesn't qualify as an urgent uh, matter. Do not text me again outside of our work hours. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know what? You're right. Sorry, I won't have it again. I'm like, okay, cool. And we're good. You don't have to be all, you know, mean and whatever, like, you know, like, you, you know, cuss people out, but you just let them know, like, this is my boundary. I'm with my children at this time, unless it is something really actually urgent. I'm a team player. If there's something urgent, let's do it. Right. But don't think that you just have access to me um, all the time like that, because the, the, from the first time you do it, it's very hard to gain that respect back from the time you let someone disrespect you. It's very hard to gain it back. Change maker. I think that in, in this, in this field, um, what we are doing through by blacks is literally changing what media looks like because we are helping not only to contribute to just to the, the, the industry with our stories, because there are so few of us doing it, but we are holding legacy media accountable because we are relentless with our critique and with, you know, show, 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 basically being a mirror to them and showing them like what they're missing and what they're the angles that they're not covering. So it's twofold. We're training up so many journalists who have come out of university that I've been able to work with and mentor. And I see them go on to work in legacy media. And then after a while, they'd be like, you know what? I want to come back. I'm like, OK, cool. But, you know, I'm, I'm a reference for them. Um, you know, I, I love being able to do that. I love being that stepping stone that says, hey, I worked at By Blacks my first year out of, out, of, out of university. And then I went on to work here. And now I'm at BBC. And now I'm here. I'm doing this. Amazing. I love that. So being that base, that's that's I feel like I, I could I could go, I could leave the earth happy knowing that I that I was able to do that, right? At CTV Your Morning, where I used to work, when that show started, they asked all of us, they said, hey, we want to start a new thing. We want new experts. Everybody, we want you to to give names of experts. I gave all the people that I put in were all black, of course. So I was like, well, I'm the only black person here. This is what y'all gonna get. To this day, that's almost going on five years ago, I think I left there. When I looked, turned on that show, three of the people that I um, suggested for them to, to have on an audition are still contributing there today. So when I think about legacy and impact, I look back and say, wow, you know what? That's a tangible thing that I was able to change. Because when I was working at, at CTV at, at, in the morning show, it was rare, if never, for us to have a black expert on that show, unless they were talking about Black History Month or something to do with racism, you wouldn't just see a black architect, a black accountant, a black who just because a mining expert. Never, ever. That would just not happen. But now we are helping to normalize through by blacks. We help to normalize black excellence, normalize black professionalism for, for people to see, yes, you can just 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 um, turn on TV and see a black woman talking about the amazing kick ass buildings that she built. What? Come on. Yes. <laughs> that's that's the change. That's the impact that we're having.
uh, yeah, I see some hallelujah clapping and finger snaps and all of that because uh, the, the normalizing black excellence, that's going to stick in my head for the next number of years. And thank you for the work you do as well with the Canadian Association of Black Journalists with Cab J, uh, pushing that uh, agenda as well. Let's go over to Bernice Carnegie, getting respect because hockey, ice hockey, it's, it's very male dominated. So how do you go about getting that respect? My respect has actually always come from a male, my father. And because uh, I worked with him for 30 years, um, he automatically commanded respect because he had a way about him that people gravitated to him and um, felt comfortable with him and were willing to hear what he had to say. And I was the person that kind of trailed behind him and I automatically got respect because I was with him. And I clearly wondered what would happen when my father died, whether um, I would get to sit in the front seat or whether I would get to sit at the, the uh, special table of, of uh, VIPs and, and whatnot if my father wasn't with me. And um, it, I had to check my ego because, uh, you know, always being in the limelight because I was with my father, uh, I wasn't sure how people would actually react to me on my own. But because I had been so involved in community, I used to attend 100 to 150 um, events a year in order to keep up with sharing um, about our own organization at Future Aces. So the community did get to know me and I did get to know them. So in hockey, um, do I get that respect? Well, I'm finding out that I am getting that respect. And part of it is because of all the work that I've done in the community. Part of it is because of my father's history. Um, but clearly, uh, there, this, this new team that I got to go in and talk to the young ladies in their final game, uh, home game. And the, the response was amazing. They were so, um, so enthusiastic to have a woman, and this is a this is really new. BIPOC ownership <laughs> hasn't happened before, and so those women were overjoyed to know that this was happening. You know, Angela James is going to be part of this. Ted Nolan and Anthony Stewart. I mean, where have you seen this before, right? So, um, I don't believe in a balanced life. I have not lived a balanced life. <laughs> and I don't think things get done in if we were to all be balanced, because there are some people that have to work harder, harder, harder to actually make the thing happen. And then they can go away and take a rest later. So my children were older when I actually started putting all my time into future ACEs full time. And so I would be working 60 hours a week, come home at midnight sometimes because I was part of the education team. So I was away from the office, but I was also the executive director for 17 years and I had to run the office and I had to raise the money. And, you know, we had to come up with 300, $500,000 a year to, to actually make things work. So I was doing all these different things and it was okay. But when my kids called me, if I was at, in my office, I stopped everything mm -hmm. because the way I felt as a mother, if my children are calling me, that's because they need to talk to me at that time. So if I was able to pick up the phone, they got my full attention. And if it took an hour on the phone with them, I would take an hour on the phone with them and I'd make up the time later. So, you know, the, the feeling of, is there prejudice when we, that we have to deal with, it's much harder to deal with prejudice when you're a mother because it hurts when you see your children 
not being valued. And you can't go in and fight for them all the time. You have to empower them to teach them how they can um, stand up for themselves. It hurts to have prejudice as an employee. And I've been an employee. And I decided to stand up. And I got ostracized. And believe me, when that job was over, I couldn't wait to get out of there. I had a sore neck for three months because I'm thinking about how it affected me. And I thought I was a strong person. I thought I was that person that nobody could do that to me, but they did. And then I was a boss. And I wasn't so much the fact that I had to deal with prejudice as a boss, but I had to deal with people who came into my office to tell me that they were hurt by other staff members. And that happens too often, too often. So I was good at consoling them. And I was a bad boss at not being able to deal with the staff members who were creating the problem. I, you know, I've learned from that. And I think I can be, I, I'm a better person now because I've experienced all of those things. Uh, but, you know, you have to take it individually. Who are you? What are you willing to invest to get what you want to get? And can you, and I love what Camille said about the difference between kindness and being nice. Yeah. I was too nice. I should have fired some people. <laughs> and I was too nice. I didn't do it. And as a result, it went on to create a problem for, for the organization that I worked with. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Bernice. And thanks for bringing up Angela James, who's another uh, woman define, redefining history by being one of the first two women to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yes, Teresa. Let's hear from you. Yeah, so I will say the disadvantage of going last all the time is I, I'm getting all these aha moments from everyone. So by the time you come to me, I'm, I think to myself, so what was the original question? But um, I, I've loved hearing from each one of you ladies. and uh, Gaining you know, respect. Like, gaining respect, okay. In your field. You know, respect is an interesting word, right? Like when mm -hmm. we think about respect, how do you define respect and how do you know you've attained it? What is evidence of being respected, right? Um, so I would certainly say that in general, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm an introspective person. So I look at my indicators. What do I do and say and show when I respect somebody? So when I respect someone, I listen to their point of view. I seek their point of view. I seek their expertise and whatnot. Uh, so I'll certainly say that in the industry that I'm in, I do feel that from peers and others, you know, asking me for my input and whatnot. So from that point of view, I certainly feel uh, a sense of respect. And I mean, to be quite frank, if you can imagine being in any sort of career for 20 years, at some point, <laughs> just by, by the sheer volume of experiences that you, you go through, you just end up being kind of a knowledge leader in, in certain parts of your, your industry. But I wanted to point to the whole self-care part because, you know, I've been really, I've been paying attention to the hearings going on in the States uh, the last couple of days. And I've been kind of seeing that the judge, you know, Judge Jackson, and she's been going through, uh, you know, quite Q&A and all the memes that have been coming out in terms of, you know, people just kind of reinforcing that, oh, we see you, we see your pain, we see you working so hard, you know, whatnot. And I was kind of trying to reflect at one of your questions where you asked something about how do you do the, the self-care piece and, you know, how do you take care of yourself? Because let's be honest, especially when things like this are going on in the media, it's so triggering because you're like, yeah, let's look at the qualifications. Why is this an issue again? Uh, but the way I take care of myself is I surround myself with a fierce, fierce group of value-driven people. I am very discerning about who I'm actually close to. So many people might point and might, may feel that I know people and I'm friends with tons of people. But the reality is the people who are actually in my inner council and, and circle are actually very value-driven people who want great outcomes for everyone. Um, usually for me, people drop out of my life as I see that our values are misaligned. 
or their behaviors are misaligned with my values. And that's kind of how I keep my peace. So when things happen, I'll give you an example. When I have a, a really good friend of mine uh, who's out in uh, Newfoundland, Alea, we became really good friends over the mining. I, I guarantee you, and, and she, I don't know if she's going to watch this, but I guarantee you when something's happening in media that affects, and she's not a Black person, but when anything is happening in media that affects Black people, she doesn't wait for me to post something. On her own reconnaissance as an ally, she's already posting. She's already reacting. So for me, that 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 sense of camaraderie and community is kind of my self care. I surround myself with people who are committed to seeing me thrive, and therefore the actions reinforce that. So I'm I feel really well taken care of. I I am sincerely blessed with. I can name a few names, of course, but I'm sincerely blessed by having women, especially women. And of course, there's some men, but I mean, we're talking it's Women's History Month here. Let's I'll focus on the women. But I, I tell you, I'm so grateful and fortunate and blessed to have women in my life of different races uh, and different backgrounds who just show up. I don't know. These people, they just show up when they need to show up. And that's how I've been able to really navigate in the mining industry. I am surrounded by women supporting women. I, I will call out one person though. Um, you know, one of my friends uh, owns a, a, like a PPE uh, company uh, called Cover Gals. It's a, co it's a coverall for women and you know, opens up at the back and whatnot. And it's just this mantra that we've developed over the years, which is women supporting women. So it just creates a value level of the types of conversations you can have at work and at home, which is, mm, are you being supportive of, like, how, how is what you're saying going to support other women? So I think just having the right people around me and the checks and balances, it, it, that's how I, that's how I, how I deal. That, that is so fabulous. We got so many nuggets, uh, Nicole, from this, this particular question, set your boundaries early, be uh, not nice, but be, what was the other nice. word? kind kind not nice yes i wrote Set that your boundaries down, early. i wrote that one. i'm sitting at the the feet of camille dundas after this i'm booking a, i'm booking a wisdom call big time big time yeah. and uh lots of kudos in the chat over that round and uh unfortunately this is going to be our last question and i'll i'll let uh the wonderful nicole ask that one I, I get to ask the last, the, the, well, yes. ask the last question because we do have a couple of questions in the chat, but I'm telling you, I, I just need to call out some of the comments. June Gervin is saying black excellence. My mentor. Action. Yes. So wonderful to be, to experience gratitude to all just loving the ladies focus on, um, on those things who are for you thick and thin. Mm -hmm. Listen, there's applause happening in the chat and, and people, I know the, the, this conversation is virtual, but the only way we can tell how you're feeling is by you putting it in the chat. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and you got to put your questions in there. Now, if they're covering everything you need, well, that's fine. Cause you know, Sarah and I can, we are talkaholics. Yes, yes? we are. <laughs> we are talk look, look, look at my friend, Camille Mitchell. She's changing up the background skyline, all sorts of things happening. Hey, look, hey that's <laughs> what I'm talking about. You know, product placement is everything. Yeah. I thought I'd field. take a moment and bring it local. I'm like, why not? Oh, yeah. I like it. So well, Nicole, the max yes, yes, Sarah. Yeah. That last, uh, the legacy piece. That I'm, I'm going to ask that question, but, yeah. but Camille Mitchell just did something there for me. That was my aha moment. I would love pictures of the buildings that you were a part of Camille Mitchell, and I'm going to make them my back. Bye bro. Yes. Yeah. I just shared this one. So for Canadian well. Toronto audience, I think it's in the middle. So the little building here, it's um, if you're familiar with Bay Adelaide Center, the yes. North Tower. So I just helped with the initial zoning when I was with KPMB Architects for that one, like determining the height. So if you're in Toronto and you notice that there's no such, um, shadow cast on Nathan Phillips Square, if you're ever there for a, a summer event that's intentional with the city, that the, um, there are no buildings in that area can cast a shadow on Nathan Phillips Square. That's why a commercial building at Bay, Bay and Richmond is 35 stories, while Young and Bloor can be 80 stories. So that's just a comment on our city's um, um, development it. but it, it was interesting working on that and working with city and the city and zoning and also ac accessibility so how do our friends in wheelchairs or vis visibly impaired can get into the building um more easily let me clap for you yes yeah. 
this this is this is Stella here, and, and I'm going to say this before I ask the next question. This is why people, you have to tune into the 100 ABC Fireside Chats. I mean, in our first season, we curated 33 chapters, and so you got to look listen out for the new season in October because the mm -hmm. architect in our in our 100 ABC world is Donna Joan Simmons, and she has already mapped out <laughs> and laid out the next 30 something topics and the next and we're curating the panelists and know that our panel that do that participate in the 100 uh, ABC fire chat chats have to be 100 ABC honorees. And so, you know, we got, we got the crumb of the crop here. Okay. Okay. So people get ready. Last question. It's all about legacy. I like a legacy thing, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm going to switch up. I'm going to switch up the, the order. I'm going to go with lady Bernice. Carnegie. So what does success in redefining your industry look like to you? Now, Sarah says success. I say victory. Eh, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. But what does that success in redefining your industry look like for you? Because you're redefining some things, Miss Bernice. Um, well, you know, I feel like everything that I've done up to this point, all the experiences that I've, I've been privileged to have and all the amazing people that I've met in community are going to be transferred um, into this new project uh, because it, it's about passion and it's about wanting to make things better. So interestingly enough, my most, in, the most implement, influential person in my life was a man. It was my father. And I just want you to think about this. Um, what would happen if more fathers, brothers, uncles encouraged equal opportunity for their wives, sisters, and daughters? Just think of what could happen when we reach out to give a hand up, build confidence and empower young women to stretch beyond who they thought they could be. Just think of what it would mean if we invested in offering salaries that allowed our women to stop thinking of hockey as a hobby instead of a career. Just think what could happen if we eliminated the phobias in the isms and we emphasized the importance of personal worth and respect and accepting the best of who we are. So when I was doing all of those initiatives in schools and talking to thousands upon thousands of kids, we had a couple of mantras. One was, I can do it. I'm going to stick to it. And we get all the kids shouting all at once, I can do it. I'm going to stick to it. And then another one of my father's favorite is, I like myself. So if we can get people believing that we can do it, and we're now setting up the template that we can do something different in hockey, that we can bring people together. That's what the Carnegie Initiative was all about, bringing all those hockey, hockey moguls and greats and, and people working everywhere together at our conference in January. And now with this wonderful team, we can do it if we stick to it. And if we get up every day saying, I like myself, I like myself, I feel good about who I am, it just means that we can actually go forward and do anything. So I see anything happening now. And I should tell you that uh, we're having a conference in 2023 in January for the Carnegie Initiative to bring all those hockey people back together to tell us what they accomplished over this past year since the first conference. So we can do it. We can do it. And you know what, Bernice, it's funny, it's, it's interesting. It's Brain Health Awareness Month. And what people don't realize is when you keep 
you know, reiterating those words to yourself, to your children, it becomes a truth and re it rewires our brain. And so it, it changes the way we think. So I thank you and we pay, you know, such honor to To that continue to to create legacy. So thank you so much, Bernice, for sharing that. And so Teresa, legacy, tell us what does success in redefining your industry mining look like to you? I think for me, I uh, so there are two fronts that I really see opportunity for people in mining. Uh, one of them is women, uh, the representation of women. Uh, needs to increase in mining and, you know, in operations, in leadership, in management. And part of that is just gender is usually the, the most, I'll say the fastest lever in which to get diversity of ideas and thought processes and whatnot. So during my lifetime, I would say in the next couple of years, I would like to see us approaching parity in just diversifying those those type of careers uh, in operations, engineering, leadership and mining. So for me, having a big impact on that piece is something that I just take personal pride in and having influenced. Uh, the other thing that I, I really am promoting a lot is when I see immigrants coming to this country, they're super hardworking. There's nothing that I find more disappointing than when people are not working at their full potential. I usually find this when I go to Toronto and I, I have cab drivers, you know, usually they're people, some people of color of some sort driving around. And if you hear their backgrounds, you, you can totally see how that person, A, is not satisfied with the job they're doing. And B, you can see why they would be a great fit for the mining industry based on their background. So I really want to influence more people to see mining as, a, as an opportunity space for them and to not settle and of course, I respect people who choose to drive cab all, you know, all their life and taxi. Uh, one thing we've learned about COVID is that we need everyone doing whatever function they're comfortable with in order for this society to work. So I respect people's choices, but where there are people who could pivot into something that is very high in compensation and where their creativity and their diverse nature can can elevate our industry, I wanna be a big part of influencing that. So I'll say for me, my legacy is, I want people to arrive. I'll, I'll use a quote, uh, words that I, I used to say a long time ago, but I, I really want people to arrive and thrive in mining. That's a, a legacy I want to have. Arrive and thrive in mining. Yes. You know? Yes. When I look at, when I hear you, you have redefined mining too, because, you know, you would think mining is just, you know, people going underground and getting all dirty and, you know, but you, you're, you're showing the different facets of mining. So thank you for that. So Camille Mitchell, what does legacy, that legacy piece look like for you? What does success in redefining your industry architecture look like for you? Yeah, so here in Toronto, I helped form two organizations. So one for black architects and interior design and BEAT, which is Building Equity and Architecture. Toronto has formed into like a national movement that is celebrating women in architecture. So I'm still part of both of those organizations, but um, following the murder of George Floyd, there was an acknowledgeable shift in the conversations that we were having in the architecture profession. So I was honored to be invited by University of Waterloo School of Architecture to sit on an advisory board as they looked at their admission, hiring, and retention practices of students. Because with architecture history, we are we start in Africa with the pyramids as architecture 101, and we never go back. So you bounce between uh, Europe and North America, Europe and North America, and in the last 10 years, we've been in Asia. But what, what is the architecture of the African continent, South America, and also the, the effects of colonialism on those buildings. So just having those conversations with professors that taught me 20 years ago is an exciting um, outlook. And also too, with University of Waterloo, it's known that all roads lead to Rome. So all fourth year students do a term in Italy. And it's even questioning that as being the sole option. Um, it, can we not pair, because I know there's, um, there's 
whether it's through the Royal Architects Institute of Canada or other organization pairing with schools of architecture in Nigeria, pairing with schools of architecture in Shanghai to expose students to a different uh, aesthetic. And also to what we're taught to value and what we deem beautiful. Um, are, is it the tallest? Is it the shiniest? And is that necessarily, um, can, can we communicate that to our community? Can I tell you, this is a shiny building I worked on for you to go live in a shiny building that makes it beautiful and nice. So like, what are those characteristics that are successful? So um, yes, I sit in too many communities at times, but if I can shape that lens and shape that conversation and start having that conversation, because at one point following, I called Black Square Tuesday, there was an initiative to hire more Black architects. So I'm like, unless you're aware of the unemployment line of Black architects, let's get Black architects and interior designers into the school, not just to talk again about, as Camille referenced, Black History Month or Black designer or Black buildings, let's just talk, show our work, celebrate our work. So that's just because we I just want to break the pattern. You're not only going to see a Black individual carrying the building materials. You're going to see a Black individual at the table giving direction, um, giving being the engineer. And that's another thing too I'm involved with, um, exposing youth and youth's family to architecture, not necessarily as the architect, but how do you get involved in building and construction in different ways. If you like textures, you could be a textile designer, you could be a furniture designer. Um, how, how, how can you turn your vision into something enjoyable and profitable at the same time? Thank you so much, Camille. That was, was, listen, you ladies are just blowing my mind right here. I'm so inspired by the legacies that you're speaking of. And so Camille Dundas, success in redefining the industry of media what does that look like for you? First of all, I assure you, Camille Mitchell will be the next feature on buyblocks.com. Uh, I'm getting that started <laughs> as of tonight. <laughs> um, success in redefining media. We're, we're just shaking things up. Like we, we are fearless, relentless, and we, demand to be heard like we're not going anywhere you know the last legacy media interview i did the reporter asked me it was shortly after george floyd george floyd was murdered and she asked me you know when all the media was doing a flurry of coverage on on suddenly on on black businesses and she asked me well um aren't you uh worried about um just having that one singular perspective on buy blacks First I said, no, <laughs> and I said, you know something? There's an old African proverb that I wanna share with you that will get you to understand why I'm not worried about that. Until the lion learns to write, his story will always be told by the hunter. I said, we are the lions and we've learned to write. And I left her with that. <laughs> and, uh, in terms of legacy, you know, if anyone is on the line who has uh, who has kids, anything you do is not cool to your kids. No matter how many awards you win, no matter how much stuff you do, you're not cool. But when I see my son who's 10 and he takes up a buyblacks.com t-shirt and wears it to school, without, you know, covering it up or anything. He's like, yeah, this is my mom and dad's company. Yeah, you know, that's my legacy. When I look at him, I said, these kids will carry on, hopefully, or at least appreciate what we've been trying to do. Or maybe it is that the the, the success is that they, they don't even notice or they don't understand because maybe by the time that, that they're 30 and 40, maybe these things won't be an issue. Let's hope, but that in itself will be a, a, a success in that we've created an environment for them that's 10 times better than what we have. Just like I know for a fact, my parents and grandparents worked to create an environment for me where I am not going through half of what they went through. That's the goal. Yes, Marie, that's the goal. Wow, like, yeah. Mic you, drop. You, me, you, almost, you almost made me drop the computer. I, I almost- Mic drop. <laughs> like, come on, Camille Dundas. Like, you're slaying it here. And, uh, you know, uh, we're almost winding down here for the night. And um, 
I, I think there's one question in the chat and I really think that we've, we've answered it. You've all answered it because you made reference to it and it was from Joan who had made mention of, can each of you give us one example of a roadblock in your journey and how you got through it? Um, and I think we kind of have, a, have definitely answered that question. I see Teresa has a comment that she wants to make. Go ahead, Teresa. Now, I saw there was another question actually uh, that came through. It was something to do with uh, partners, having a partner who's supportive, how that's shaped your career path. And uh, I, it's something, it's, it's just by coincidence. It's something me and my girlfriends were in uh, mining, we're talking about re uh, recently. And, you know, there's a Harvard Business Review article on this very topic. And it, what, it, what it does though, it, it's talking about, you know, having a partner and, and whatnot and, and the influence of that on your particular success or going for more things or who's more successful, who's not. But I think it comes back to what I was saying earlier about being relentless about who is in your inner circle and weeding out negativity and, and things that don't serve you well. Um, I, I, I would say um, for sure, I've been very fortunate. I have a very supportive family unit that is um, you know, aware of what I'm doing and they don't get in the way, but they watch. And I think they appreciate what it is we're doing for the community. So I think as much, as much as you want people to cheerlead you, it's also them not making you feel like, you know, appreciating your superpower and what you're doing in the world. So I just thought that was an important component because it is true. Sometimes when you're working in technical fields and whatnot, it on top of working, you know, like what Camille Mitchell was saying, on top of working tons of hours, you, you don't need a lack of support at home. And I would say for young people, you do need to look at that very carefully who is in your inner circle as you take on different projects and challenges uh, just so that they're not a det detractive force. And I have a bonus uh, mini question. And Camille Dundas actually had started this question of support. Camille, you had talked about resistance from even our own community to what you and Roger have been trying to do. Can you, can you talk about that when your own community is who is kind of getting in your way? You know, it's it's that we not only do we have to fight racism and discrimination every day, as we're doing that as black folks, we also have to fight internalized racism. Right? Mm -hmm. We have to fight colorism, shadism, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And you'll be surprised at the number of black entrepreneurs, business owners, etc., who do not want to be categorized as a black architect, a black whatever, a black this. So they don't want to be associated with buyblacks.com. They don't want to advertise their business on buyblacks. They don't want to me to do a feature on them in buyblacks because they don't want people to associate them with that. Because we are still in this mindset where we think that 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 being black is a pigeonhole that if we associate ourselves with with blackness then we won't be able to get other clients that people will see us as a only black this or whatever like it's look if you look at buy blacks right now if you go to the website the majority of ads that we have on there are not from black owned businesses hmm. that should tell you something right yeah so it tells That's you that corporately owned businesses see a value in selling to our community, see a value in promoting their goods and services to our community, but we don't see that value. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, good point. And on that note, uh, and with that food for thought, and that's a whole other fireside chat right mm -hmm. there. <laughs> We're curating conversations through this conversation. Absolutely. And so, I mean, all I have left to do really is to thank all of these Black and brilliant and bold and fearless and persevering. Persevere was the word of the week, uh, courtesy of Justice to be KGB, uh, KBJ rather, not the other way around. Um, what an amazing conversation. Uh, a lot of great advice, a lot of amazing insights. And the chat was just flying and it was on fire. It was on fire the whole time. 
And uh, it was just really my honor to co-host this with Nicole. Nicole, over to you. Thank you so much. And you know, I know we have uh, some other questions coming in, but we're running out of time and we just wanna make sure that we honor people's time tonight and we will do our best to get to others and uh, we will send the panelists your questions. Uh, please look in the chat for their contact information. Be sure to follow them on all their social medias, go to their websites and we must support each other. These women did exactly what it was said in you know, Canada's Women History Month. They inspire us, they continue to inspire not just us in Canada, but nationally and internationally. You know, I am so, I am so, you know, normally you say you don't have to tell people you're humble, but I am humble tonight, just listening to this conversation. My heart is full, my eyes are full. Sarah knows, Sarah can tell, you know, this, I am weepy because when I, when I, when I hear the supercalifragilisticnaciousness of this, yes, I created a new word, hallelujah. I'm a Trinidadian, I can create new words. Um, it's part of my specialty. Um, it, 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 is, it is such a privilege and an honor. And I, and I want to make sure that uh, we just thank you for your courage, your boldness, your grace, your perseverance in the midst of it. You know, your support, your mentorship, your kindness. Camille Dundas, yeah, we're all, we're all like, everybody's now redefining how to do boundaries after this one, after this one. And so, um, you know, I, I want, I want you to smile. Can I, can, you know, if we were in public, I'm going to say, can you smile for the camera? We're going to take a group picture here. Smile. Nicole, Nicole, I just yeah. thought of something before we take the photo. And as you are thanking us, I think it's important for us also, I'm going to speak on the, on behalf of the panelists to thank you and Sarah. Nicole is a stalwart in the Toronto community for, she's someone you can call anytime, any day for anything. I want to call out Sarah. I can't believe I haven't called this out yet. When I was in journalism school in Ottawa, Sarah and another fantastic woman gave me my first opportunity to work on a documentary about uh, Black Canadian radio and um, television uh, journalists in Ottawa. It was the first project I ever worked on while I was still at school. They gave me money to go and do to go and do an actual project. Sarah gave me that. So I want to thank you for that, Sarah. That was my first first stepping stone outside of school. So I appreciate you. I am honored you said that. Now, folks, don't go anywhere because Dr. Denise O'Neill Green is coming up. She's like one of my mentors, but I have to get this group shot with these women. The photo. This, this, this photo. Okay, smile, ladies. Okay, so up next, don't go anywhere. Stay in your virtual seats. Get your hands ready, your round of applause, because coming up to the virtual stage of the 100 ABC women, you know, we are redefining, women redefining history is one of my favorite women. She is, she, will, she, she doesn't brag about who she is, but I'm gonna do just a little bit of bragging for her. Um, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green is a visionary and an inspirational leader and one of the nation's recognized experts in transformational and strategic diversity and inclusion leadership, student access and development, community engagement, talent management and organizational change. Dr. Green has worked with many senior and executive leaders from post-secondary government business and nonprofit sectors as a keynote speaker, innovative strategist, educator, and change maker. People, welcome to this 100 ABC Woman Redefining History stage, the co-author and one of the co-founders of 100 ABC Woman, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green. Dr. D. You sure you're talking about me, girl? You're in the house, Lydia. You're in the house. Well, I know we, we've had a wonderful event. I know we're coming to our end, and I was given the responsibility to provide closing remarks. And so just want to share with everyone that I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. And in case you don't know, Toronto is also in the dish with one spoon territory. And the dish is sometimes called the bowl 
And I'm saying that because when you think of a bowl and all of us eating out of, out of this bowl, it means that we share responsibility to ensure that the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and even more importantly, of each other. And I think what we've done over this hour has really helped to take care of each other and to bring together a true sisterhood, which is something that I constantly uh, admire of all the 100 accomplished Black Canadian women. And actually, we have 400 to date that we have recognized, just so that all of you know. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their stories, how they have and continue to persist, persevere, as was said, is the word of the week, if not the month, succeed and achieve, setting those boundaries, dealing with prejudice, silencing those imposter voices, being kind to others as an empowered choice and making sure to be kind to ourselves. I want to just take this moment to thank everyone, including those who have contributed to this evening's event and to its success. So starting out with the supercalifragilisticexpialidocious co-host, <laughs> uh, Sarah Omiyango and Nicole Waldron. Thank you so much for hosting our, our event this evening. We must give thanks to Crystal Van Restor for her opening remarks. This event would not have been possible without our technical support from Malcolm Edwards, Daniela Glasgow, Michelle Green, Sambo Savoye, and Kit Throng. Also our social media and comms team, uh, Darren Simmons-Wright and Karis Clark Glasgow. And last but definitely not least, my co-founder and co-authors, the Honorable Jean Augustine and da -da -da -da, Donna Joan Simmons. Just want to remind everyone to purchase the book, 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women. We have several different issues. I don't know, Donna, if we have any back issues, but the 2020 issue is on sale now. And just in closing, just to remind everyone what the 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women Project and Publication is all about. It's about making the invisible visible. And there's so many contributions as you've heard from this evening that Black Canadian women, accomplished Black Canadian women have done to contribute, Camille, to the landscape of our city, our province, and our country. So may everyone have a great evening, be well, and take care. Thank you, Dr. Denise. Thank you, Dr. Denise. And as you know, yes. and as you've heard her, please go to the website. There's a sale on for our past issues of the book. And be sure to mark in your calendars right now, the book launch and gala 2022. And Camille Dundas is a 2022 honoree. She's one of the newbies. So all your, all your sister, your frat sisters, like I'm, on, I'm in a fraternity people, it's my only fraternity. Um, we welcome you on September 17 to the 100 ABC will celebrate the achievements of 100 honorees. And on the 24th, we are going to have a symposium and uh, so you, you need to tune in, book those two dates, go to the website, follow us on our Twitter, our Instagram, our website, and the fireside chats. You know, we've done 33 already. And on Sunday, October 16, mark your calendars now, till July 25th, 2023, we are curating 35 more fireside inspirational conversations. 
Uh, Sarah, I don't know about you, but I am truly full. I don't know what your last words will be tonight because I, I am almost speechless, beloved. Speechless. You know what? My, my last words is clap for a sister, okay? Just <laughs> clap for a sister. Clap for her and clap for her by nominating her. I spend half my year nominating people, <laughs> but especially women, because we're too humble to do it ourselves. And there are so many of our elders, especially, yes. who end up leaving us without having been publicly recognized for the amazing contributions they have made to their community, to their city, to their country. So please, as you purchase the, <laughs> the, the, the 20, uh, 20 and previous uh, issues that are available on the website, please already start thinking of who you are nominating to be the 2024 cohort. I've already started, I've already got a list. So thank you all of you for tuning in, all these people who tuned in from the West Coast, uh, California, uh, British Columbia, people across the border on the other side in um, Charlotte. I saw Charlotte, South yeah, Carolina. Charlotte, I believe. North Carolina, we had yes. Yes. Thank you so much for your support and your interest. And uh, yeah, keep going to our YouTube channel. Watch all the chats that you missed because you missed many of them, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to welcoming you again for our next event. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. We, we love and appreciate you all. Take care. And remember to go out the door Come back in and walk home. Walk safe. Walk good. Not because we're virtual. You gotta, you gotta go back and come back again and do something good for yourself. And remember to inspire another woman today. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. on your own but never alone through the rain and through the shine here's your moment it's your time